Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're coming at you with the midweek update in the world of cannabis. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. Then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the fastest growing industry in the US, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. And we're going to start today with this article from Kiplinger, Investing in Cannabis, Three Top Trends for 2022. And I think it's just safe to say that what we thought would be a 2021 story has now just become a 2022 story. That's really it. It's going to take a bit longer. So plan accordingly and try to invest as much as you can to prepare for this situation. And again, this is not advice. I'm just trying to deliver the education so that you can make the decision for yourself. But what's next for cannabis investors? We look at three vital trends that will define the landscape for the year ahead. But I just want to point out this one first paragraph. The U.S. cannabis industry is growing at an unparalleled pace. Cannabis sales for 2021 are estimated to finish at $31 billion, an increase of 41% over 2020. And yet, despite this positive growth sales, the outlook for investing in cannabis is mixed. Now, this sentence right here was a bit misleading because I'm pretty sure U.S. cannabis sales are going to hit $24, $25 billion. And so I actually found the source of this article. So just to highlight, global cannabis sales surged 41% year over year, and it's global cannabis sales that are going to hit $31 billion, uh, and increase 41% compared to 2020. If we look at the U.S. BDSA forecast cannabis sales to, sur to surpass $24 billion in 2021. So I just wanted to highlight this because I shared this on Twitter, but it was a bit misleading because it doesn't specify that this is global cannabis sales. While the U.S. is still growing at an unparalleled pace. I think it's just good to try and decipher the difference between that. But the main thing this article highlights, financial optionality improves, especially for the tier one MSOs. M&A activity will accelerate. And then lastly, Canadians bet on U.S. legalization. So if you wanted to check this article out, you can grab it below, but it's got a bit more information as to why we want to be more forward looking into 2022, especially as both the Democrats and Republicans plan to file a legalization bill. So this is going to be a big election issue uh, come November of next year. While Kiraleaf is happy to announce $425 million private placement of 8% senior secured notes do 2026. So we know that again, without the safe, simplest form of safe passing, this does not affect the tier one MSOs to be able to raise capital versus the small mom and pops. Um, and sadly, the minority entrepreneurs that are mostly affected by safe not passing now and having that delayed further on. But to highlight, today, Cureleaf announces, or this was on Monday, that it has received commitments for a private placement of 8% senior secured notes due 2026 for aggregate gross proceeds of $425 million. And just to add, from my understanding, private placement comes from a, an individual or individual investors, not through a brokerage. So it is more confidence in saying that some investors are happy to give Curly 425 million at 8% so that they'll be getting, you know, I think it's 34 million paid back semi-annually. Just a bit more detail on the breakdown of this, the notes which will be issued at 100% of face value will be senior secured obligations of the company and will bear interest at a rate of 8% per annum. So 8% at 425 would be 34 million a year, payable semi-annually so they can pay twice, 17 million, 17 million, and equal installments until maturity date unless earlier redeemed or repurchased. The notes will be governed by a trust indenture to be entered into on closing of the offering, the indenture and the indenture enables the company to issue additional notes on an ongoing basis as needed, subject to maintaining leverage ratios and complying with the other terms and conditions of the indenture. And then in addition, the indenture permits up to an additional 200 million uh, US of senior bank financing. Cureleaf intends to use the net proceeds from the offering to refinance existing indebtedness for working capital and to pay transaction fees and expenses. And the notes will mature on December 15th, 2026. The offering is expected to close on December 15th, 2026. 2021, subject to customary closing conditions. So it seems like a victory for Cureleaf Longs, especially because it's non-dilutive on the equity side. However, this really does just highlight again, with or without SAFE, the tier one and tier two MSOs are likely not going to be effective because they can lower their cost of capital based on the healthy balance sheets that they do have and the growth potential from their operations in the coming years versus the small fish, like the small business owners and the minority entrepreneurs. Sadly, just goes to show that Schumer's move last week is really helping the bigger guys get even bigger and crushing the small guys. But onto this tweet from Aaron Idelheit, CEO of Mindset Capital and a new bull of the great American growth story tweeted, it's amazing watching credit markets get more bullish on US cannabis and equity holders sell. 
What a competitive advantage for the top companies. And he says this in response to MJ Stock Trader tweeting, Cureleaf announces their new debt raise at 8%, which is tied with the industry low. Now, I just want to share because I'm a new investor trying to soak up as much knowledge from other investors that have more experience than I do. But from my understanding, what he's saying here is that typically when credit lenders are lowering their interest rates, that is a signal that in time, equity valuations will increase because if credit lenders are willing to loan at lower interest rates, they see less, they see less perceived risk in these companies. Therefore, equity investors should also see that. And what he says is amazing is that as credit lenders lower their interest rates, equity holders are selling, which seems wild. So just wanted to share that. If you know any bit more about this trend of you know credit markets leading equity markets, let me know in the comments as I think it could help. Um, but just wanted to share that. But onto this, then Todd Harrison shares with Cureleaf raising this new amount of money, boom, all these price targets come out of these investment firms. So this is Stifle on Cureleaf, giving Cureleaf now a buy rating of a price target of $31 Canadian. Uh, and then this one is AGP. Thank you, Todd Harrison, for sharing as well, giving Cureleaf now a price target of 23 after again raising this new form of cheap debt. So just wanted to share this. These links will be below if you want to grab them and read them, but I'm not going to end up going through them myself. Uh, but on to some other MSOs is Green Thumb Industries to open Green Star Herbals Chelsea in Massachusetts. It's, 68 it's 68th retail location in the nation on December 15th. So they're happy to announce that it will open Green Star Herbal Chelsea in Massachusetts on Wednesday. Uh, today, the store will be rebranded to Rise in 2022, and profits from the first day of sales will be donated to Lo La Collaborativa, an organization committed to empowering Latin immigrants to enhance the social and economic health of the community and its people. So, uh, good job, Green Thumb, as they continue to expand and open new stores. As Columbia Care launches the UK's broadest portfolio of dosable medical cannabis extract vaporizer pens, the first company to manufacture extract vaporization products in the UK. Now, I did not know that Columbia Care was doing this much outside of the US as well, so this was news to me. Might be news to you as well. Uh, announced today that this is the first company to formulate medical cannabis extract vaporizer pen products in the UK based manu in a UK-based manufacturing premises, licensed and approved by the UK's Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency uh, and Home Office. Adding the products launched under its flagship medical seed brand and are comprised of four formulations that will be available for patients throughout the UK when prescribed by a special consultant. Now, how much of this prescribing is going on? From my understanding, not a whole lot. So it's just worth figuring out how much money Columbia Care is actually making from this side venture before considering and investing in them based on this sort of exposure. But again, this is not advice. That's just my opinion based on what I've seen and learned from this industry three years in. These new vaporizer pens complete Columbia Care's initial medical product portfolio, which includes tinctures launched in April 2020 and its proprietary solid fill powder capsules launched in April 2021 that remain unique in the UK market. This portfolio of products offers clinicians and patients in the UK the broadest range of medicinal cannabis products with the capability to target different onset periods and duration of effect. So on to some other tweets. Jungle Java shared uh, the recent updates from MSOS. Now this a big thank you to Jungle Java for the work you do in making this information easily accessible and visible to us, adding here are the changes made to their MSOS holdings for December 13th, 2021. Now despite how awful the price action has been the last two days, it's more the same and it hasn't changed. I'm immune to it and hopefully you're getting more immune to it as you learn about the intricacies and how investing works while also gaining experience over time. But just to add that MSOS still has 97.3 million on hand of cash that they plan to deploy. So for anyone thinking, well, why didn't they spend that a few weeks back? This is a good thing why they didn't because the shorts, because safe didn't pass, so the shorts are still at it. Smarter for them not to act on that and allow the price to go down, but hold on to the cash so that they'll be able to buy back in time with this cash um, and create new shares um, and offset you know, the selling that we're seeing. But I just want to add also, why is the selling? Few reasons. So just to add, we've obviously seen what the shorts are doing on the CSE, and I have no doubt in my mind that they're somehow in the US doing it on the OTC. Now, obviously that's just speculation, but if you happen to have a website like shortdata.ca, uh, but an American version, please let me know in the comments so I can try to just investigate more just because I couldn't find an American version of that site. But we know that these shorts have these companies on a string like a yo-yo just at the beginning of the week selling them off by the end of the week they buy them back up and they've been doing this for months and they're likely going to do that until we get some sort of a catalyst that scares them away and has the bulls step in to take control but at the same time there's also tax loss selling and so if you're investing in these msos in a non-tax friendly account using a brokerage account um, then you know, if your, if your investment has gone down in value, you can sell that before the end of the year and get a tax loss credit or benefit um, on your taxes the following year. So that's why we're seeing any retail selling if there is. And sadly, those retail sellers will have to wait 30 days before they can get back in. And so that is something that is also likely contributing to the selling, but doesn't mean that those retail sellers who are tax loss selling, doesn't mean that they don't want to buy back in immediately after the 30 days that they can. And they're just hoping that they're going to see share prices similar to what they're seeing today. So just wanted to add that for perspective. Uh, hopefully that was clear. On to this one from Brady Cobb. Um, as MJ Stock Trader again tweeted, now E-Trade is out scaring people away from pot stocks. 
got this warning this morning saying over-the-counter cannabis related businesses securities risk acknowledgement now reading going through this is just like okay yes i think anyone should understand that investing involves risk however brady cobb sees this as it's the risk disclosure i've been waiting to see when not if confirmed and so from my understanding first glance i couldn't help but think how is this positive for us investors but then i scrolled down and saw these three words clean hands doctrine so thank you at mso invest jacob for tweeting this because these three words triggered a memory in my mind and then joe griesler added it signifies acceptance of trading in cannabis otc and so from my best understanding this is what the clean hands doctrine means and this is why brody seems this as a positive and the risk disclosure he was waiting to see because while the federal laws are still as they are and regulators can go after banks for working with cannabis businesses or custodian shares of plant touching companies from my understanding this is a risk disclosure that these banks can send out to regulators basically to say hey look we know what the laws are but we're going to go ahead with this anyways so please do not come after us and so that's my best understanding of it let me know in the comments if you know any more and i'm not saying i know more about what the clean hands doctrine is or what this can mean than you do but if you know more than i do and we can put that together we can potentially come to a bit of truth as to what this could possibly mean but if brady someone with a lot more experience in investing and in business and in dc sees this as a positive it's just worth considering why that might be but what do you think let me know in the comments whether you think this could be a ploy to scare existing existing shareholders out of their shares, or this could be a sign that there is some sort of legislative catalyst coming on the horizon, one big enough that the banks saw it was worth sending this out because the risk is worth the perceived reward that they can bring in. So last few stories I wanted to share, or last few tweets at least, Sabatino, this comes from S. Andrioni on Twitter, who's a great source for cannabis uh, visual entertainment in the form of videos, but also for tracking the short seller's actions. So just wanted to share this because this sort of jumps off of what I shared on Sunday. My video, if you go to shortdata.ca and you check the CSE, the Canadian Canadian Securities Exchange, the largest short positions held uh, for companies on there, you would see all of the US MSOs. But this just highlights that Cresco Labs, Cureleaf, GTI, and Trueleaf, um, we see the number 79 consistent with sort of this this behavior of just selling, buying back up, selling uh, for like a penny less too. They just put the order down by a penny and they just sell all day, see what they can end up getting. But just wanted to share that 79 is what we see in common. And what does that even mean? And I'm just trying to decipher this as best possible. A lot of US brokers use 79 to execute in Canada, by the way, much like a lot of Canadian hedge funds likely use 79. And 79 would represent as a broker CIBC, a big Canadian bank that allows the utilization of their platform. So CIBC you could consider would be willing participants allowing the sort of predatory short selling behavior whether it's from Canadian hedge funds where naked shorting is sadly legal in Canada, it shouldn't be, but it is. And from my understanding, naked short selling is illegal in the US. However, if US brokers are using a Canadian broker, it's possible that they would allow them to do the same predatory naked short selling. Again, this is speculation. If you know more about this, let me know in the comments so that we can try to arrive to an actual, uh, you know, closer truth. But just wanted to share that as it sort of touches off the, the fact that the shorts are active and continuing to do this until some legislative change happens. And then lastly, just wanted to share this one from the Dales Report, as this is a really good um, podcast with Safe Banking Act held hostage, Trade to Black podcast. But what they do here um, from, 10, from 11.29 to about 28 minutes, they interview the CEO of Richard Carlton, and he answers as to what the CSE is talking about in creating that second tier and how this is going to benefit the MSOs and why they're doing it. They're basically doing it for the MSOs. So I would recommend watching this if you haven't especially if you wanted to broaden your understanding into the world of finance and how stock exchanges work. On to some stories, this one from Marijuana Moment. Actually, most of these ones will come from Marijuana Moment. It's congressional lawmakers file a bill to streamline presidential clemency as drug war drives mass incarceration. So we'd love to see these call to actions, but it'd be great if Biden would just do what the American people want him to do and keep his campaign promise. A coalition of congressional lawmakers on Friday introduced a bill aimed at streamlining the presidential clemency process with supporters arguing that it could help address mass incarceration that's been driven by punitive policies like the war on drugs. Reps Ayanna Presley, Cory Bush, and Akeem Jeffries are leading the Fair and Independent Experts in Clemency Act with more than a dozen additional co-sponsors also signed on. The legislation would take clemency review authority away from the Justice Department and establish a new independent board comprised of presidential appointees to facilitate relief for people with certain federal convictions. It seems like they mean well, but it would also just be great if Biden would do what he said he would do or the Justice Department would do what they said they would do. Well, federal scientists say onerous U.S. cannabis regulations hinder urgent research. Yes, we know this. 
because in a new paper published by the National Cancer Institute, a research team of six, including authors from federal agencies such as the National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institute of Health, and Food and Drug Administration, turn a critical eye on cannabis regulatory systems in the U.S., writing that administrative burdens stifle much-needed scientific investigation into the drug's potential health applications and safety concerns. Gosh, do we not already know this? Conflicting federal, state, and cannabis regulations hinder research in several ways, says the article published this month in the Journal of National Cancer Institute monographs, including the ability for researchers to access products that are legal in their state, a lack of standardization and quality control of cannabis and cannabis-derived products within and across states, and no national oversight of the standardization and quality control or the industry. With the most obvious regulatory hurdle in conducting cannabis and cannabinoid research is the Schedule 1 ca status of cannabis, where cannabis never belonged in the first place, so hopefully these federal scientists are getting closer to a resolution to this problem that they keep talking and talking about. Onto this one, as the U.S. Supreme Court asked to settle states' conflict on medical cannabis insurance reimbursement. So this is interesting, as the Supreme Court is being asked to settle an emerging dispute on whether employees can be forced to reimburse workers for the cost of medical cannabis used to treat job-related injuries. To date, state courts have come to different conclusions on the issue, a situation advocates say warrants intervention from the high court. In a friend to the court brief filed last week, Empire State Normal and two other groups, the New York City Cannabis Industry Association and the Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Association say the justices should take up an appeal out of Minnesota, using it to settle the broader tension on the conflict between state and federal cannabis laws for good, because this is the constant conflict that's in place when no one does anything and allows this nonsense to continue to go on. Now, going further than the narrow issue of workers' compensation reimbursements for cannabis, a key piece of the group's argument is that federal government has been so inconsistent in its enforcement of cannabis laws that prohibition should be overturned entirely. And so the case itself, Musta vs. Mendota Heights Dental Center, arises out of a dispute over whether the Controlled Substances Act, CSA, preempts a Minnesota state law requiring employees to reimburse workers for the cost of medical cannabis to treat a work-related injury. In October, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that the CSA indeed prevented the reimbursement. That ruling contributed to an emerging split between state courts on the issue. The main Supreme Court had decided a case in that state along similar lines, while Supreme Courts in both New Hampshire and New Jersey have ruled that reimbursements to medical cannabis patients can go forward regardless of federal prohibition. So yes, this is something that the Supreme Court should strike down and just solve once and for all. That would be fantastic. And so just to add really the juice of this, Mendota Heights Dental Centers is due to file its response to Musta's request for the Supreme Court to take up the case on January 14th. So that's a month away. It sort of just kicks the can down the road. After that time, the justices will decide whether to hear the appeal or not, but this does really show, again, just another example of why the status quo is very much untenable, because in certain states you can get medical cannabis reimbursed, in others you can't. Someone's got to make up their mind and decide what it's going to be and what it's not going to be. So I wanted to share that one. Well, this one is interesting, as Visa warns against misuse of cashless ATMs used by cannabis retailers to skirt restrict restrictions. Which begs the question, Visa, what are you doing trying to crush the fastest growing industry in the U.S., and one that 70% of the U.S. agree that we should legitimize? As Visa, the world's second largest card payment company, recently issued a compliance memo to customers warning them that miscoding point-of-sale transactions through the use of so-called cashless ATMs, a practice used by some cannabis retailers as a workaround to accept credit or debit cards for purchases, could lead to penalties or other unspecified enforcement action. Why don't you specify what these penalties could be so people could you know, know what you're going to end up doing to them? So anyways, just wanted to share this. This was the memo they sent out, but I thought like, what does this even mean? How does this work? Because this is nonsense to me. So this sort of explains it all. As a cannabis retailer, for example, a $45 purchase may be rounded up to $60 and coded as a cash disbursement. The retailer would then subtract the purchase price plus taxes from the apparent $60 withdrawal and return the change to the customer. To the payment processor, it would, like, it would look like a $60 ATM withdrawal, but to the customer, it would seem as though they'd bought cannabis with a card. While Visa's memo doesn't mention cannabis specifically, it notes that cashless ATMs, which are sometimes called reverse ATMs, are primarily marketed to merchant types that are unable to obtain payment services, whether due to the Visa rules or rules of other networks or legal or regulatory prohibitions. Uh, a category which includes cannabis businesses. So yeah, an ATM designed for cannabis businesses or anyone doing something that might be illegal, honestly. With federal prohibition preventing most cannabis retailers from accepting credit or debit cards as direct payment, some have uh, seen the use of cashless ATMs as a convenience for customers and thus a smart business decision. Rather than maintain an on-premise ATM or ask customers to show up with cash, they can simply swipe a, swipe a card like any other retailer. Companies that market cashless ATM devices, meanwhile, remind retailers that customers tend to spend more when they can pay with plastic. While Nathaniel Guerin, 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 CEO of FinCan, which provides financial services specifically to cannabis businesses, estimated that thousands of cannabis retailers in the U.S. currently use what he called the cashless ATM solution in order to accept cards he set a, a setup he described as clever, attractive, and likewise fraudulent. 
What keeps me up at night, well, and it's only fraudulent again because the federal government refuses to change those laws. What keeps me up at night is that when, not if, one or more eager assistant U.S. attorneys with their eyes on advancement sinks their teeth into this, it has the catastrophic potential to derail our industry's momentum and inflict great damage, he said in an email to Cannabis Moment or to Marijuana Moment. While Visa's compliance memo is brief when it comes to enforcement, misuse of cashless ATMs will be subject to non-compliance assessments. Uh, and or penalties or subject to further compliance enforcement, it says, but it does not include any details. So it's annoying. The company did not immediately respond to emails uh, and phone message from Cannabis Moment. While we urge Visa and other financial institutions to constructively engage with lawmakers and the cannabis industry on payment options, he said, ultimately, Congress will need to step in by passing the Safe Banking Act, which we are urgently working to pass. This comes from Steve Hawkins, CEO of U.S. Cannabis Council. But lastly, other industry groups and myself, and you would likely include, just be like, express disappointment with Visa for targeting cannabis retailers rather than helping support them because they would bring a lot of money to Visa in the long run by legitimizing this industry and allowing, you know, regular payments through card like any other industry. So on to other stories though, as Montana lawmakers approve cannabis rules ahead of January 1st, launch of legal sales. So this is a big one. And so just to highlight main thing out of this, adult use cannabis sales will start and officially open on January 1 in Montana. So great job, Montana. Good job for the lawmakers on allowing this to get done. And especially for the citizens for making this happen. Well, out of New York, 400 plus New York towns, villages opt out of adult use cannabis sales. So this comes from MJ Biz Daily. A large number of municipalities in New York states are choosing to forego adult use cannabis shops and consumption lounges, at least initially. A total of 252 towns and 162 villages have chosen to ban recreational cannabis sales, while 279 towns and 179 villages chose to ban consumption businesses. The Associated Press reported, uh, citing tracking information from the Rockefeller Institute of Government. The ban comes ahead of December 31 deadline for municipalities to make a choice on whether to allow cannabis businesses within their borders. So according to the APP, 414 have banned sales and 458 have banned consumption lounges, representing more than 25% of the state's towns and 31% of villages. So this is still a minority present. Um, it seems like based on this information, more states than not actually did allow sales and did allow consumption lounges. So not sure why they want to lead with the negative. I guess it's because you know, people uh, are more drawn to negative stories because it rattles their emotions a little bit more, but just wanted to highlight that. As these bans can be repealed at a later date under state law if they decide that they do then want a dispensary, um, and adult use sales aren't likely to begin until 2023 anyways, as sadly New York continues to kick that can down the road. But in other positive news, St. Louis mayor signs bill to decriminalize cannabis possession and cultivation. So big win for the citizens of St. Louis. As mayor of St. Louis on Monday signed a bill to decriminalize cannabis possession and cultivation for adults, a local reform that comes as efforts to legalize cannabis statewide in Missouri is also gaining momentum. The St. Louis ordinance signing comes weeks after the Board of Aldermen unanimously approved the legal legislation, which makes it so 21 adults 21 and older can possess up to two ounces of cannabis without facing the civil penalty that's currently in place. It would also make it so no resources could be spent to punish adults for cultivating up to six flowering plants. Importantly, the measure only affects local policy and does not change Missouri state law that continues to criminalize cannabis for non-medical use. Well, this is a positive because it stops criminalizing people for possession in St. Louis. Sadly, not launching an adult use market at the same time really does just invite the black market to come in and invites organized crime groups to come in, supply that demand, and become even more powerful and successful, sadly. So hopefully they can get on that sooner than later. But onto this one as Malta to legalize cannabis for personal use in European first. So Malta will this week become the first European country to legalize the cultivation and possession of cannabis for personal use, pipping Luxembourg to the post as the continent undergoes a wave of change to its drug laws. Possession of up to seven grams of the drug will be legal for those aged 18 and above, and it will be permissible to grow up to four cannabis plants at home with up to 50 grams of dried product storable. And a vote in favor of legislation in the Maltese Parliament on Tuesday will be followed by the laws being signed into the president or signed by the president in order for it to be enacted by the weekend. Owen Benici, the minister responsible, told The Guardian. And so I saw a tweet from Owen Benici yesterday saying the A's have it and they did vote for it. So we should see this signed into law before the end of the week. And I'll report on that on Sunday. So good job, Malta, getting this done first in Europe. Well, lastly, just another study to highlight the benefits of medical cannabis. Medical cannabis certification is associated with decreased opiate use in patients with chronic pain, a retrospective cohort study in Delaware. It's more of what we already know, but positive because it seems like another legitimate study to determine if medical cannabis certification helps patients in Delaware with chronic pain reduce their opioid use. So results, the average change in prescribed opioid use was found to be negative 12.3 morphine milligram equivalent units when including all individuals. Among the included individuals with baseline opioid use, medical cannabis certification was associated with a 31. 
1.3% average decrease in opioid use. That's pretty big. When examining subgroups based upon pain location, individuals with neck pain displayed a 41.5% average decrease in medical cannabis use, while individuals with low back pain were observed to have a 29.4% decrease in opioid use. Similarly, individuals with knee pain reduced their opioids by 32.6%. The results display an association between medical cannabis certification and a decrease in opiate use among study group individuals. What do you know? The study suggests that medical cannabis use may help individuals to reduce their opiate requirements along with physician intervention. And based on with other studies, we know that it will help them reduce opiate use. Yet they say more research is needed to validate these findings with appropriate controls and verification of cannabis use. It'd be great if we could deschedule the plant so that we could start these studies and find the therapeutic benefits to the best overall medicine that we have on the planet. So lastly, just wanted to share this video that would be humorous, but this is the reality if you decided to become a cannabis entrepreneur and start your own dispensary as a guy fights off thieves with a bong. This is a, you know, American of the Year award. <laughs> this guy's a legend. Good for him. It's like, so ridiculous. Thank goodness they don't have guns or they would have killed him on the spot. But this is what you're forced to do when your government will not work in the favor of the people and pass, you know, just the simplest form of safe banking that would help small businesses and minority entrepreneurs just get a start in the industry and compete with tier one MSOs along the way. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or concerns and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody.